Um, our next speaker is Dr Lindy Roberts, who I know many of you already know, but she is a duly qualified pain specialist and anaesthetist with clinical interests in complex acute pain, ENT anaesthesia and perioperative medicine. She's a former examiner for the Faculty of Pain Medicine and uh, has contributions on opioid tolerance, addictions and addictions in the three editions of the Acute Pain Management Scientific Evidence that uh, is released by ANSCA. She's a current ANSCA Director of Professional Affairs and obviously a former ANSCA President. She's an avid film noir fan, an amateur magician, and I'm very, very proud to have her in our department and to speak to us today um, on Shakespeare's Eye, Pain Management in Anesthesia. Thank you, Lindy. Thank you, Divya, and thank you, Dale Currigan, for inviting me to speak. You might be wondering um, what this presentation has to do with arguably the greatest figure in literary history, and certainly our most famous playwright of all time. For many years, there have been conflicting theories about um, the Bard's demise at the age of 52 in 1616. In 2006, German academic Hammerschmidt Hummel, in her book, The True Face of William Shakespeare, claimed that she had forensically examined portraits and masks, um, sought opinions from medicos, and had concluded that Shakespeare had a rare cancer of the tear duct that may have both led to his demise and may also have caused considerable pain. And I think if this is true, we can only speculate what that may have done to his later years of writing, which were primarily, of course, the tragedies. Whilst this theory has been roundly criticised by experts in the art world, primarily due to the debate about the authenticity of Shakespearean portraits, cancer and the pain that is often associated with it is a growing reality for many of our patients and their families in, the, in our century. Recent figures from the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare reveal 135,000 new cancer diagnoses and about uh, 50,000 deaths each year from cancer in this country, representing about a fifth of the total disease burden. These are the four areas that are relevant to acute pain management in cancer. And I'm going to limit my discussion to adults, as this reflects my practice, and I won't cover regional blocks in relation to cancer outcomes, as that has already been so eloquently covered by Dr. Lurk. If you're after good references, I'd recommend the late 2016 issue of International Anesthesiology Clinics, which has a series of good reviews on cancer outcomes, and also the college and faculty document, Acute Pain Management Scientific Evidence, for topics two and three. I have no conflicts to declare, and I'm going to focus primarily on issues of pain management. And my hypothesis on reading the, this literature is that although there are limited studies to date in humans surrounding cancer outcomes, in fact, um, all of these areas have a synergistic, um, uh, are synergistic in terms of the sorts of treatments that we might be thinking about in managing cancer patients. So the cancer population is clearly a heterogeneous one. They often come for repeated surgeries and they may be presenting at various stages in their cancer journey from diagnostic and staging procedures right through to palliation. There's increasing awareness that the perioperative period may have a disproportionate impact on important outcomes, such as cancer outcomes, but also on the development of chronic post-surgical pain. We know that in solid tumours, more than 90% of deaths are related to metastases, and that tumour handling at surgery can lead to micrometastases and minimal residual disease, which can be later reactivated. The stress response, of course, we're all well aware of, leading to release of chemokines, prostaglandins, and cytokines. And also there's um, changes in um, adrenergic and glucocorticoid si signaling related to um, impacts on the autonomic nervous system and also the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. These all affect immune surveillance, which is the primary defense mechanism. We know that natural killer cells have a central role and that their number and function can be affected by pain, anxiety, and by the various drugs that we administer. Many factors such as vascular endothelial growth factor promote angiogenesis that, that enables tumor growth and spread. 
And cancers can also express receptors such as catecholamines, prostaglandins and opioids. And this means that the drugs that we use may have positive and negative effects on cancer growth. There's a dynamic interplay between the various protective and um, tumour promoting processes and the balance is likely to be the thing that determines cancer outcomes. It's hypothesised that a cancer anaesthetic and analgesic plan would promote improved outcomes by minimising the stress response and tipping the balance in favour of host defences. So mechanistically, the approach would be anti-adrenergic, anti-inflammatory and minimising immune suppression. And given that inflammatory and autonomic activation are involved, perhaps blocking these pathways could improve cancer outcomes. And we have a few pieces of evidence to suggest that. Although, as Professor Lurk has pointed out, the human evidence is rather shaky at best. So we need large studies um, to show us what um, is likely to be the impact of our management on cancer outcomes, and certainly a number of these are underway and will be reporting in the next few years. The immune effects of opioids are complex and they may have both pro and anti-tumour effects. Opioids inhibit both cellular and humoral immunity and they also affect the autonomic nervous system of course as well as the hypothalamic pituitary axis and also increase angiogenesis and potentially disrupt the endothelial barrier function. Some cancers express opioid receptors which may be a prognostic indicator and also means that opioids can directly affect tumour growth. Not all opioids are the same, however, and if we look at natu natural killer cell activity, for example, morphine and fentanyl suppress it. Buprenorphine, oxycodone and hydromorphone seem to have n minimal effect, and tramadol may actually enhance um, opioid um, effects on natural killer cell activity in both animals and human studies. The effect appears some, in some cases, and some models at least, to be dose related so that morphine can actually, at low dose, improve natural killer cell activity and in high dose, suppress it. In animal models at least, nociception itself is immunosuppressive. Our knowledge of opioid effects, as Professor Lurk has pointed out, is mainly from animal studies along with a few volunteer studies and there are very few um, studies of human outcomes for cancer. So there really isn't enough evidence as yet to radically change our practice, but good pain control appears critical and multimodal strategies which minimise opioids are likely appropriate. There may be value in particularly targeting patients who preoperatively are on particularly high doses of opioids as they may be a vulnerable group in terms of adverse opioid immune effects. And this would re warrant referral for opioid reduction to, prior to elective surgery if there's time. So other approaches, um, we've seen the information about the propofol volatile story and there's some retrospective data to suggest that this may be important. Surgical approach itself may also be important, although the studies of minimally invasive versus open surgery are conflicting at this stage and small in number. There's also some emerging evidence that ERAS protocol um, compliance may also affect ca cancer outcomes in colorectal surgery, although again that's just really um, small, small um, data at this, at this stage. We know that local anaesthetics have anti-inflammatory and anti-hyperalgesic effects and they also reduce surgery-induced immune changes in animal models and reduce inflammatory cytokines in human, um, in human patients after surgery. But there are limited data on cancer outcomes apart from where local anaesthetic is used in regional blocks. And there's at least one large study of intravenous lignocaine underway. Breast cancer cells express NMDA receptors, so there's theoretical reasons at least why an NMDA receptor blocker such as ketamine might have a positive impact on tumour growth. However, bench work suggests that ketamine may also suppress natural killer cell activity, so there may be opposing effects, and we don't as yet have any human data. We're increasingly aware that some of our patients will develop chronic post-surgical pain, which will be defined in the forthcoming ICD-11 classification as pain persisting three months after surgery or other tissue injury. The mechanisms include inflammatory, autonomic and immune system effects with peripheral and central sensitisation, 
And we know that there's a neuropathic component because these are often associated with sensory changes. Chronic post-surgical pain results in significant community and individual costs such as lost, lost work years, suffering, reduced quality of life and increased healthcare utilisation, making it a major disease burden in our communities. Just how big a problem it is depends upon how you measure it. Many of the high rates that we've seen quoted for surgical procedures are because it's measured as a binary outcome, pain present or not. However, if you use more multi-dimensional criteria such as the impact recommendations, clinically meaningful pain that, is, that affects physical and psychological function is present in between 5 and 10 percent of patients post mastectomy and about 1 in 10 of thoracotomy patients, post thoracotomy. So who's at risk? Certainly younger and female patients, those having repeat surgery, which of course is our cancer population, and those with pre-existing chronic pain. There are particular psychological factors that lead to vulnerability, and there are genetic influences. So we know that um, haplotypes of COMT and also mu1 opioid receptors can lead to um, differences in the prevalence of chronic post-surgical pain, and that's been particularly shown after abdominal surgery. Yarnitsky in 2008 in a small study also showed that the quality of our descending pain inhibition can be important. So that they used um, something called, they looked at something called diffuse noxious inhibitory control and in an experimental model were able to show um, that if you had inefficient diffuse no uh, um, DNIC that you were more likely to have um, chronic post-surgical um, pain after thoracotomy. And if you had efficient descending control, your rates of chronic post-thoracotomy pain were reduced by about 50%. We know intraoperatively that surgery associated with greater nerve damage has an increased incidence. And from Michael Chan's work in the follow-up of the Enigma study in Hong Kong, that avoidance of nitrous oxide may also be associated with an increased rate risk of chronic post-surgical pain. The post-operative factors look like a list of the things that we see in our cancer patients. So moderate to severe acute pain, radiation and chemotherapy, and psychological vulnerability, including depression, anxiety, and various other um, psychological factors. So what can we do? The first thing I think is to identify patients who may be at higher risk and then where possible undertake a procedure specific approach and address individual risk factors. Obviously some of these are not things that we can actually change. What we know is that the standard opioid centered regimens for surgeries associated with neuropathic pain and chronic post-surgical pain may be insufficient. Regional analgesia has been shown to be beneficial for thoracotomy and mastectomy with relatively small numbers needed to treat. However, caution should be exercised because these are a small number of randomised control trials in a small number of patients. Intraoperatively, IV lignocaine may reduce post-mastectomy pain. Ketamine by infusion is also effective, but it probably needs to be continued for more than 24 hours. Gabapentinoid studies show conflicting results. Gabapentin has been the most studied and usually in a single preoperative dose where it may reduce longer term pain. Pregabalin is less studied and seems to be subject to publication bias. A small study has showed that the SNRI venlafaxine may reduce postmastectomy pain when given at a fairly small dose for 10 days postoperatively. It's fair to say that we don't have the full picture as yet. And there are some large studies underway. For example, Professor Phil Payton from Melbourne is uh, under the auspices of the ANSCA Clinical Trials Network and with NH and MRC funding is studying the effects of ketamine on chronic post-surgical pain in the ROCKET trial. The, the third area is patients with pre-existing pain and opioid tolerance. And this is an interesting study that looked at what happens to chronic pain patients if you track their surgical site pain postoperatively, and this is in orthopaedic surgery. So their pain scores on movement are on the y-axis, and you can see the x-axis has days 0 to 15, 
post op and um, the chart is day one post-operatively through to day 14. The blue lines are patients with chronic pain and the orange lines are patients who have chronic pain and opioid tolerance. And their scores have been averaged to show the rate of pain resolution. So the first thing to notice is how much individual variation there is. Secondly, resolution occurs at the same rate in these two groups, but the patients with opioid tolerance have higher pain scores. And this may reflect opioid-induced hyperalgesia, or it may also reflect psychological factors such as catastrophizing and anxiety. These are non-cancer patients, and studies in cancer pain patients show similar individual variation and similar opioid use to their opioid tolerant um, non-cancer counterparts. However, in general, cancer pain patients have lower pain scores. The implications are that we need to individualise treatment. We can expect higher pain scores, and these, these may be a manifestation of opioid-induced hyperalgesia. And this makes multimodal analgesia even more important. However, management approaches to date are primarily based on expert opinion. There are an emerging a small number of randomised control trials, primarily in spinal surgery and mostly for non-cancer indications. This is the specific history in a cancer pain patient that will help to guide your management. So who's looking after them and what's the prognosis? Where's the pain and how well is it managed in terms of their usual pain scores and function? What are they taking uh, in terms of tolerance and the potential for withdrawal? And this has to include um, over-the-counter medications. It's worth also um, identifying those who have intrathecal pumps because these will create tolerance and may affect um, w whether you can use a regional anaesthetic or not. You may also need to seek advice for their perioperative management. End organ function will clearly impact on your choice of analgesics. And psychospiritual issues, um, including anxiety and depression and end-of-life issues, will affect the pain experience and your management. Prior experiences are really critical, and this is often a question that I will ask in the pre-admission clinic, is what's happened in the past? And often you will get bad experiences, but you also need to find out what's worked, because that's worth pursuing. And obviously, who will be involved when they go home? Preoperatively, the key to management is working out a multidisciplinary analgesic plan that that's both you and the patient have agreed together so that they have trust in the plan. Continue their usual medications, particularly their opioids, right up until the time of surgery. In opioid tolerant patients, the general rule is anti hyperalgesic, anti allodynic, and, and anti neuropathic adjuvants. Gabapentin and pregabalin have all of these advantages and plus they are anxiolytic, so they make very good pre-medication for opioid-tolerant patients. This is a group that's recognised to have an increased risk of awareness, and so consider a depth of anaesthesia monitor. Blocks are useful. If you're using neuraxial opioids, it's sometimes difficult to work out what dose to give, and I often give it at the upper end of the um, normally quoted range. And neuraxial opioids won't necessarily prevent withdrawals, so you'll probably need to give some systemic opioids as well. We know that remifentanil is associated with opioid-induced hyperalgesia, and so I'd be cautious in using it in the opioid-tolerant patient. But if you do need to use it, it can, it's effect, the effect of um, remifentanil on, on opioid-induced hyperalgesia can be reduced by co-administration of ketamine, magnesium, COX-2 agents, and also with a pregabalin premed. Postoperatively, these patients have two to three times higher opioid requirements than their opioid-naive counterparts. And um, so a PCA is a useful mechanism because it allows them to titrate to effect. You should continue their usual opioids or replace it if they're unable to take it, for example, with a PCA background. Simple analgesics and adjuvants mostly have not been well studied in this group. However, um, ketamine in, spi in spinal surgery certainly can improve um, opioid requirements and analgesia. 
Gabapentinoids are anti-tolerance in animal studies and so may be helpful. And clonidine reduces withdrawal from opioids, is analgesic, anti-hyperalgesic and anxiolytic. Tepentadol with its mixed noradrenergic and opioid activity is likely to be useful if there are neuropathic, uh, neuropathic components to the pain. These patients need to be monitored because they often will be more sedated than the average bear, and this is often um, because their opioids have been ra rapidly escalated again, uh, beyond their usual requirements. If there's pain escalation, your plan B must include careful assessment to work out whether it's the usual pain or the surgical site, whether they have a surgical complication, because that can be difficult to diagnose in a patient who may have high pain scores, whether there's a neuropathic component that guides therapy, whether there's high use that might suggest opioid-induced hyperalgesia, and whether they have distress that's amplifying the pain experience. My approach is usually to adjust or add adjuvants and increasing or decreasing opioids may be required depending upon the circumstances. Switching to a different opioid, which is often done for chronic cancer pain management, can be effective because of incomplete cross tolerance. And you may need to seek help from a pain specialist or a palliative care physician. So discharge planning should follow the um, reverse analgesic ladder. So we know in the WHO analgesic ladder is used in cancer pain to step up therapy, and this is the same idea but stepping down to their usual regime. It's likely that they will have a longer duration of acute pain, which we've seen already in the Chapman study, and most importantly is communication with the GP and with other treating teams. It's also important to, the ed to educate the patient, and in our, in our hospital, the patient receives a template which actually indicates what the proposed plan is for stepping down their analgesia in the post-discharge period and who to sit, how to get help if they need it. With improved treatments, cancer survivors are a growing group and we need to think about their specific needs. Clearly, this can be life-changing and patients will have various access to coping strategies and to resources. Community-based surveys find that many of these patients have unmet needs in a number of domains. Anxiety and depression are common, and fear of recurrence is almost universal at some point in what is often a complex journey. We've spoken already about chronic post-surgical pain in this, these patients, but they may also have pain related to their radiotherapy or their chemotherapy, and from incidental causes and these can have a significant impact. There's been a recent re-evaluation of the long-term use of opioids for cancer survivors, and in particular concern that they may lead to adverse effects. So a more modern approach to long-term management may be similar to what we um, do for non-cancer pain patients in which opioids have a very limited role. So what are the implications of cancer survivorship for us as anaesthetists and um, for pain management? Firstly, they may be psychologically vulnerable if coming for a diagnostic procedure or frightened that symptoms mean recurrence. And secondly, they may be physically vulnerable if they have ongoing pain or they're opioid tolerant. And we may need to consider referral for optimising of ongoing pain management, particularly in situations where they're on high dose opioids. So these are the questions to ask ourselves when we see patients coming for cancer-related procedures. Why is this patient having this surgery? What types of pain might she have or develop? And at what stage is she in her cancer story? What impact might my management have on the cancer or on the development of chronic post-surgical pain? And first, fortunately, those questions and the management are really in step in terms of what we can do. Are there complexities for cancer pain management? And who else is involved in the care? And most importantly, do I need some help? So these are my take home messages. Cancer and chronic post-surgical pain are both major public health issues. What we do for our patients perioperatively makes a significant difference, potentially at least, to both of these problems. There's certainly biological plausibility 
good animal data and emerging clinical trials. These areas have become research priorities for our specialties with a, large, with a number of large trials underway to address gaps in our knowledge. So the ideal analgesic plan minimizes progression to chronic pain by optimizing acute pain control and addressing other risk factors for chronic pain. These approaches are similar to those that would be, in theory at least, improving cancer outcomes. However, this awaits further data. Thank you.